can we go back a little bit and talk about the the culture that's involved in your pieces? You did that piece with De Niro, mm -hmm. the taxi driver piece. Yeah. Um, I, you do these Nicholson pieces. Um, and I also see a lot of like fear and loathing in, in, in your stuff. Were you, how are you like, were you raised in a way that you ingested a lot of movies, a lot of music? Cause you seem to, uh, bring a lot of that culture from your life into your work. Yeah, totally. I mean, for me, I started out creating work. Like my body of work that you guys know today is just from relating it to graffiti and street art. So I wasn't making canvas to sell. I was making graffiti and paintings for people in the neighborhood, people walking by to connect with and and like iconic images that people would enjoy looking at and that I enjoy looking at. You know, I'm I'm painting Goodfellas because it's one of my favorite movies or a De Niro or you know what I'm um so it's kind of based on my graffiti and connecting with people. Sick. So, but I really, I enjoy anti-heroes. Like, you know. Uh, Taxi driver, yeah, for exactly. sure. For sure. So uh, I like kind of Jack Nicholson vibe and the Joker, the new Joker I did a piece of. Did you always want to be a superstar artist? Because you, it, from what you just said, you know, painting uh, graffiti on walls and then yeah. to where you are now, was that ever on the horizon or? Yeah. I mean, I can say this now because it actually came true, but like every birthday, since I can remember as a kid, when I blow out the candles, I would say, I want to be a famous artist in museums. No way. Oh, sure. So like every, every year I would be like, this is my wish. This Sick. is my wish. I didn't tell anyone that. And then when I had my first museum show and then I guess I was kind of known by people, I was just like, all right. Now yeah. what do you, now what do you Change wish your wish. Yeah. Don't I'm not going to say it. <laughs> <laughs> do you miss anything about being uh, like, cause that, that underground like art scene, like the graffiti by night, like that's a, that's a huge click of his own. Like there's, there's, you know, books and magazines and 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 podcasts dedicated to that yeah. art form of being a, a runner on the New York, you know, New York streets or L.A. streets. Do you do you miss anything about being uh, unrecognized and being on the come up and like and trying to bust your ass? Yeah, and I mean, I miss it. So I had so much fun. I, ha I remember I had this old 74 Bronco with no doors and back. And I would just fill it with paint cans and like buckets and shit like that. And the thing was trash. And I would just <laughs> roll around LA destroying the streets. Like it, it had off-road tires and it didn't have doors. So I'd literally like hop up on the curb and like graffiti out of the door and like spray paint out of the door and then like drive off to the oh, next spot. Sick. Like Or like use it, like come up on the curb and stand on it to get a high spot or, you know, just not really giving a shit. And the, the LA scene presented uh, new opportunities to you. you. I mean, at that point in 2008, 2009, 2010, it was like LA was the epicenter of street art and graffiti and creativity. It was just a special moment in time. Mm -hmm. And it was before, they they call them buffers, where it's like the city where they come and they paint over your stuff. So they didn't really have a buffing squad so much in LA. So your pieces would stay up forever. So uh, that was, it was an amazing time. There's books about it and you know. That time period. That time period was very special. What's the what's the spot now? Like what's the most vibrant street art scene right now, would you say, if you had a call? Miami it? for sure, 100%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wynwood, Miami Wynwood, is yeah. like the number one spot. It's the epicenter during Art Basel, which is coming up. And I'm lucky enough to be like, have most of the walls in Wynwood. Like we, we've really taken over. Admittedly, when I was a kid, I was always a bit afraid to pursue my dreams, my true dreams, because they were risky and they uh, weren't a guaranteed uh, path of success for me, but I knew I could be a good engineer. And I think a lot of kids that have that dream to become something big are, are kind of uh, deterred or scared off when they're young because society has kind of funneled people to go down a certain path. And 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 this, I was, I was even afraid to drop out of college to pursue a career that I had, that are, had already been working for me even. How scary is it to tell your parents, mom, dad, I'm going to go paint on walls illegally at night? Or did they not know you were doing it? Like, how do you, how do yeah. you, you have the balls to pursue a career path as um, unknown and into the dark as that? Well, I mean, first of all, I kind of knew my career path from the start because in high school we had uh like one of those contests where you can enter your painting yeah. and then the painting can go to an art fair and the painting won 
the in class it won the award and then went to the art fair and then sold for 500 bucks oh. so in high school i had 500 bucks cash like that's like a million dollars yeah, now yeah. does you know what i mean yeah. like i was rolling in it so immediately i knew i was like bro this is yeah this I, 500 I, bucks cash like i'm good like yeah. i'm gonna work on this but but once i got into graffiti and i started getting arrested a lot my mom like obviously i'd get grounded and she'd be like well, you're gonna go to jail for life like crying like because it was really scary like I mean, imagine that moment when I was having an art show and my mom was helping. My mom's an amazing artist. She's the one who taught me how to paint oh, cool. and draw. Oh, there she's, it is. she's an amazing artist. Got she's it. like one of those like ladies that does those oil paintings that take like a year and it looks like exactly like the field oh, with the cows yep, and like the, yep. the French countryside type shit. Those yeah. take a year to make? You know, like, the, oh, yeah. you know, not 15 minutes, yeah, huge okay, impulsive yeah. graffiti, you know? <laughs> so, uh, so she taught me how to paint and draw and stuff like that. And then when I started doing graffiti and like the cops were coming and she actually was helping me finish my paintings in that space when the cops were around <laughs> it. So she knew what was going on. So she was like, dude, you're She's fucked. She's a ride or die. She was like, you're fucked. Like, do not like stop doing graffiti and all this stuff. Now it's like, it's so ironic that that's what yeah. made me the artist that I would never be here if it wasn't graffiti, yeah. you know? That's so, cool. so don't, so don't listen to your mom ever. <laughs> so never listen to your parents. No, 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 no. <clears throat> Man, she must be so proud of you. She is. She's, she's very proud. And the pops? Uh, you know, my dad's a little out of it. My dad was in the music business actually, which is ironic. He was the president of Columbia Records. Oh shit. For, for a number of years. Like he discovered like Peter Tosh and Jamaica and he was huge in the music business. So this media art stuff kind of runs in your family. Do you know the craziest thing is there's a picture of my mom and my dad on their first date at Andy Warhol's house. No Holy way. Shit. Yeah, and Andy Warhol's there. Holy shit. It's the craziest thing. That's nuts. That, that was their first date because my dad was like trying to flex that he knew Warhol. Yeah, and- yeah. That's a flex, man. That's a, <laughs> that's a serious flex. Yeah. You, you collect as well? I'm assuming you have some Warhols. I have two, yeah. But my dad had one when he divorced his first wife, who was like the richest lady in the world, Johnson & Johnson, billionaire lady. He and he just like walked away from it because he had no ego. But uh, the next guy who divorced her got like the biggest set of like 500 million or something. But more of the story, he uh, he went to Andy Warhol's house and he was super sad. And Warhol gave him a, a print of Mick Jagger and signed it like, I hope you feel better. Oh, cool. Da, da, da. Cool. But my uh, my cousin has it. So we're trying to buy it from my cousin. I don't know how my cousin. How does that? It's, it's, your, it's, your, it doesn't make <laughs> it's a long right? story. Yeah. Yeah. If yeah, they're that, watching, it's not vaccinated. Thing. It's really weird. <laughs> <laughs> my dad's a little out of it now. He's selling some possession. You know, we got to work it out. My, my dad, dad sold him a truck. I got him <laughs> and then bought a motorcycle. And he didn't tell me he did it. <laughs> 